Hi, and welcome to this newest video on our Radio Sky. In this video, I thought I'd explore a little bit what the sky actually looks like in radio, and what are some of the things that we can look at using radio telescopes. So to start things out here, I've got a all-sky map. So this is the entire sky laid out flat as if it were a map. Now this is kind of a famous map. It was made at 408 megahertz by three radio astronomers, Haslam, Salter, and Stoffel. And this is sometimes called the, the Haslam map at 408 megahertz. Now this line here at zero declination, which kind of looks like the equator, that's the part of the sky that goes directly overhead if you're sitting on the equator. Up here is the North Celestial Pole. That's where the North Star would fall. And down here is the South Celestial Pole. So you can tell right now that it must have taken at least two different telescopes to make this map. One to observe in the Northern Hemisphere to get everything from zero declination and up, and another telescope to cover the Southern Hemisphere. Now the map we were just looking at is an equatorial projection, which means that it's laid out the way the sky rotates by from our perspective here on Earth. But I've always found these projections to be a little hard to wrap my head around. So here I have an animation of this same map, the Haslam map, reprojected onto the celestial sphere so that it looks as it would look as it passes by overhead as the Earth rotates. And we'll start out looking as if we were standing at plus 45 degrees latitude, looking overhead at the radio sky. And as we progress through the night, starting at LST, a local sidereal time, of zero hours, and progressing through the whole day, we see one view of the galactic plane as it rotates by overhead. And as you can kind of see better now, the galactic plane really is laid out on a great circle that we can see rotate by on the sky. Here's that same map as we would observe it standing on the equator as it rotates by overhead. We see the north galactic spur, uh, something closer to the galactic center passing by, and then we start seeing the galactic poles on either side, which are the regions farthest from the galactic plane where the radio sky is the least bright. And finally, just to complete things, here's an equivalent observation of the same sky as it rotates by from minus 45 degrees latitude. In this, you can see one of the Magellanic clouds down there by the south celestial pole. It's, it's rotating by. You see Centaurus A come by, and then you see the galactic plane and the center of our galaxy go nearly overhead. Now this Haslam map at 408 megahertz is just one of many maps that you could make at a whole range of different observing frequencies. At every frequency you can make a whole different map of what the sky looks like, but it turns out that there are a lot of common features between all these different radio wavelengths that you can observe at. So I thought I'd point out some of the striking features you'll see here and how they relate to the emission mechanisms, the underlying mechanism for how the radio light that we observe is created. So maybe the most striking part of this is the galactic plane. That's the Milky Way seen in radio. And it turns out that our own Milky Way at radio wavelengths at these low frequencies is about the brightest thing on the sky. It dwarfs almost all other smaller compact objects on the sky. And at particularly low frequencies, it can even outshine the sun. So you see that the radio sky looks quite different at lower frequencies, where the Milky Way is itself perhaps the brightest thing on the sky. Now what's causing all this emission in the Milky Way here? Well, it's something that we call synchrotron emission. Synchrotron emission is made from having magnetic fields, so they're magnetic fields caused by charged particles moving around inside of our galaxy, magnetic field, which we'll call B, and an electron comes in here and starts spiraling around in this magnetic field. And as it spirals around, it gets accelerated, and that acceleration produces radio waves that go radiating off. So synchrotron emission is electrons spiraling in magnetic fields. And the dominant mechanism for generating these radio waves that we see here in the Haslam map is precisely that. It's a bunch of fast-moving, so fast that they're relativistic, electrons in our galaxy spiraling around in magnetic fields. And that's the source of the plane. It's the source of some of this, uh, what's called the North Galactic Spur coming off there. It's also the source of some of the more notable features that are not associated with our galaxy. And two of those are Centaurus A, right over here, and Cygnus A, which is a little hard to see, but is over here. And I've got a zoom in 
of the Cygnus A region down here with an image made by Chris Carilli made at 1.5 gigahertz on the very large array, a radio telescope in New Mexico. And in this picture, Cygnus A is a galaxy, a very far away galaxy here in the center. It's just this tiny little dot. It's so far away, it's just this tiny little dot. But out of this galaxy, out of the supermassive black hole in the center, we have an outflow of electrons that have been accelerated to almost the speed of light out of the enormous amounts of energy generated by the supermassive black hole here in the center. As these outflows of electrons go farther out and start cooling, they begin decelerating and interacting with each other and generate these enormous, what almost look like fireball lobes of radio emission here and here. So again, in this case, at low radio frequencies, we're seeing emission that comes from accelerating electrons almost directly. And so aside from the synchrotron emission associated with our own gal galaxy, a lot of what we see in the radio sky are far away galaxies, like maybe these little points here. They're so far away that all you see is the synchrotron emission from those galaxies reduced to a kind of a single little point. And these single little points, which you might think correspond to stars that we look at in optical, are not stars at all. These are entire galaxies. Stars themselves at radio frequencies are very, very dim. We can hardly even see the stars that are nearest to us in radio wavelengths. But galaxies are extremely bright as, for example, Cygnus A over here or over here, which is Centaurus A. Now when you look in at Centaurus A, it kind of looks like a, a big peanut here. And it's very similar to Cygnus A in that it's got these two big outflows out of a galaxy in the center. So these lobes here are the outflows out of the center. And they're not actually the arms of that galaxy. We're used to seeing in optical these spiral arms. And in fact, we can see Cygnus A with its spiral arms here, but they're laid out perpendicular to these outflows that we see in radio. So we don't really see all the stars that make up this galaxy. We're just seeing these big electron outflows out of the massive black holes in the centers of these galaxies. So in radio, we can see very well our own galaxy. We can see other uh, nearby galaxies as these big outflows, and we can see very far away galaxies as these points. Now another type of emission that we can see at radio wavelengths are things called pulsars. So over here is Vela, and Vela is very famous for having a, a pulsar, the Vela pulsar. Now a pulsar is a neutron star right here, which is the remnant of a stellar death. So it's when stars burn up all of their fuel and begin expanding into red giants, and then eventually stop burning hydrogen and helium, and they lose pressure and collapse and then reignite the rest of their remaining fuel. After they do this, if they aren't very massive stars, what's left behind are these neutron stars, which are literally made up of neutrons. And these things have almost the mass of an entire star bundled up in something so dense it's about the size of a small city. But they have incredible magnetic fields, which are shown here as these kind of loops. So there's these big magnetic fields on them. But these neutron stars are also often rapidly rotating. They're spinning around very quickly. And they're spinning so quickly that at some distance from the neutron star, these magnetic fields would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light in order to keep up with the rotation of the neutron star. But that can't happen as we know from relativity. And the result is that these magnetic fields begin drifting behind the neutron star as it spins around until they pile up a little bit over here and they start reconnecting with each other instead of reconnecting back down to the, the opposite magnetic pole of the pulsar. And when that happens, some energy is released and we get a burst of energy outward, some of which goes into accelerating electrons that produce a pulse of radio emission. So there are lots of pulsars on the sky. The Vela pulsar just happens to be one of them, but we've discovered literally thousands of them. And that's something that radio telescopes are uniquely good at, is measuring the pulses from these pulsars. Now a final emission mechanism that we can also use radio telescopes to observe are electronic transitions in molecules or in atoms. But to be at radio, where the energies of photons are very low, these have to be very weak transitions. So these are often highly forbidden transitions. And the most famous of these 
used for radio is called the 21 centimeter line, which is a hyperfine transition in neutral hydrogen where the proton in the center of hydrogen has a spin in one direction and the electron going around it has a spin in the same direction. And then spontaneously, this higher energy state drops to a lower energy state where their spins are anti-aligned. And this produces a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeters or 1.4 gigahertz. Using the 21 centimeter line, we can, we can easily observe all of the neutral hydrogen in our galaxy. And so even though this is a highly forbidden transition, that it takes 10 million years for a hydrogen atom in the excited state to drop to the unexcited state, there's so much hydrogen in our galaxy and in other galaxies that we can use this 1.4 gigahertz line, or 21 centimeters, to map hydrogen in our galaxy and in other galaxies. While equatorial coordinates are convenient for understanding what you'll observe from any point on Earth, a much more natural coordinate system, if we're going to start studying our galaxy, is a galactic coordinate system, such as this one, where the plane of the galaxy has been laid out along galactic latitude of zero. And we can see the North Celestial Spur sticking up above. We can see Centaurus A over just right of center at positive latitude. We can also see the Large Magellanic Cloud, which was near the South Celestial Pole, also just right of center. And to kind of get a bit of perspective on what, of how the sky that we, as we know it, is laid out in this galactic coordinate system, I've laid out an optical image along the same projection so that we can see the Milky Way as you would observe it with your naked eye on the sky. Uh, you can see again the large Magellanic cloud, but you don't see Centaurus A very brightly, and you certainly don't see anything like the North Galactic Spur. And we can also drop into infrared here, and then laid out on this map are some of the constellations that you might recognize. So for example, on the right hand side near the edge, at just slightly negative galactic latitude is Orion. And we can see that there's a lot of infrared emission over there, which tends to come from star forming regions. We see Andromeda Galaxy over on the left side, again at negative galactic latitude. And highlighted are some other things, such as the Cygnus region, again, where we had those massive outflows in radio. There's the Ophiuchus region, which is a well known star forming region the lupus region, and we also have the Vela region, which was the site of that Vela pulsar. Now we've been climbing down in wavelength, going from optical to infrared. We now drop down into radios. So this is a map, uh, and in contrast to some of the previous maps, this is a partial map. It doesn't quite cover the entire four pi steradians of the full sky. But this map is made at 21 centimeters now. So now what we're looking at is the hydrogen in our galaxy and in nearby galaxies emitting through its weak hyperfine transition. And now you can see Centaurus A show up again. Here's Centaurus A. Uh, and you can also see our own galactic plane. And you can start to see some of the filaments out there that are signs of some of the synchrotron emission starting to crop up. And finally, as we drop down from 1.4 gigahertz here to 408 megahertz, we have the Haslam map again, where you can see some of the features from the 21 centimeter map show up as being synchrotron emission and we're not looking at the direct emission from hydrogen anymore. And as a result you can see that the galactic plane is much less pronounced at these lower frequencies because we're looking at the synchrotron emission from these regions which starts to get self-absorbed at these lower frequencies. and We aren't as much looking at the direct emission from hydrogen. Now finally, I thought I'd flip around and show you an X-ray all-sky image from the Fermi satellite. And the reason I bring this up is because in terms of resolution that you get on the sky and regions of interest, sometimes X-ray emission is more connected to radio than optical or infrared. So for example, one of the best ways to find pulsars recently has been to take these X-ray maps made by the Fermi satellite and locate these brighter regions off the galactic plane, so these bright little what look like point sources. And these aren't stars again, these are things that are forming X-ray photons, so these are very high energy interactions. And it turns out one of the common sources of these high energy interactions are neutron stars and the reconnection of those magnetic field lines. So in order to find pulsars, people have been looking at X-ray maps such as this one and zeroing in 
on some of the hot spots with radio telescopes to find the pulsars. So that's a brief introduction to our radio sky. Thank you for listening.